Recording from the awesome Frontier Labor Studios in New Haven, Connecticut, it's the 10 Billion People Podcast, where we talk about, in the most unorthodox way possible, about the phenomena shaping human migration and global movement that are only getting more complex as the world approaches 10 billion people. Welcome to uh, episode eight, maybe nine of the 10 Billion People Podcast. We're not sure, to be honest. It's been about a year. Uh, since we've been on the air. And the last time we were here, Eli McDonald was in the studio with me, Damien DeNoble. Eli got a new job. He moved to Washington, D.C. He is helping child refugees, I think, find a foothold in the United States as an immigration lawyer. I'm sure he's doing badass work and wish him all the best. Since then, we have looked for ways here to give rebirth to the podcast. And I couldn't think of a better way to do that than episode one of 2024, having Maureen Abel here. Maureen Abel is a Yale professor and she has a really good ground level view of the case that we're covering today, Campos Chavez versus Garland, which was decided by the Supreme Court on June 14th, 2024. How that is going to affect real people on the ground. And we're going to be discussing it with an eye or an ear towards making it palatable to you, our listener, who's a regular person. I don't expect any lawyers to listen to this podcast. Also here is the new producer and co-host of this show, Keith Higgins. Keith is not a lawyer, but he is an interested party who's going to make sure that we represent the voices of the people on this podcast, meaning that we don't blab on in a way that only other lawyers understand. And Keith is also the producing genius behind Any Given Day, our new video cast, video podcast on the YouTube channel Frontera Labor. So do check that out. Uh, It's where I, every week, talk about what's on my mind, typically something that irks me or inspires me or just something that I've been thinking about that week in the context of law. With that said, Marine Abel, Campos Chavez, presented to you here on the 10 Billion People podcast. Um, Immigration law, yes. Removal defense, no. A little bit less. A little bit less, but close. (laughs) I'm close. Why did that make you laugh? Because I never had any plans of going into academia. And to be clear, I am a visiting clinical professor, so I don't teach classes. Uh, I work at New Haven Legal Assistance, and we have a contract to staff a couple of the clinical classes, which for people who have not gone to law school is, it's a class you take where it's extremely practical and you are mentored by a practicing attorney. There's a classroom component, yes, there's readings, yes, but you are also given actual cases and actual clients to do work with under supervision. So it's less academia and more a way to get minions in like an internship for credit. But your minions. You my get minions. minions. I have law students. I have Yale law students as my minions. It's great. Well, that, that's fantastic. And when did that start for you? That started during the pandemic, which, let me tell you, access to Yale's COVID testing, really sweet perk. (laughs) (laughs) How, when you probably were able to get testing before anybody else was, or Um, or how did that work? What what was sweet about it? They just, the stockpile that they had, because um, they were needing to test their students frequently enough that it would be safe to have a campus environment. And so... I was able to get tests when I needed them. I wanted to go home for Christmas. State of Connecticut could not get me tested until December 26th. Yale, I was able to get tested not just the day I made the request, but I got tested on the 21st. Wasn't sure I had given myself enough time, got retested on the 23rd. Was able to go home knowing that I did not have COVID. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. I... This this was September 23rd, 2020? This was December 21st and 23rd. um, December, December, yeah, yeah. Yeah, was that... 
2020 or 2021. I can't remember anymore when yeah. I started with the clinic. It's, a, it's One day we will stop talking about COVID as a generation, <laughs> but that day has not come. <laughs> no. It's still it's still an anchor in our mind. It's mm-hmm. still an anchor in our mind. So, so th- that started about four years ago. Essentially, you, you started in this position and then... Yeah, I actually started in uh, the domestic violence clinic because that's another one that is staffed by my agency. We had someone leave... And that is the real reason I laugh. I happened to be in work that day. My boss realized that this colleague who had left for a new job was going to have to be replaced. And I was just literally the attorney with family law experience who was physically closest to my boss's office. So 2.30 on a random Tuesday, my boss comes into my office and says, do you want to teach this clinic to replace Kate. And I looked at her and I said, I'm sorry, did you just come in here and say, hey, do you want to be a Yale law professor? (laughs) (laughs) And that is how that happened. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that sounds exactly like what I would expect it to be at Yale, right? (laughs) They probably posted a job to 100 people, interviewed six, and they just had you in mind the whole time. Well, they contract and, they contract with our agency. For I'm just, I'm just the joking. Of, yeah, and you, you <laughs> evilly laughed while you were in the meeting. Like, so tell me why you'd like this position. <laughs> mm, no, my reason's better. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you like the hotel that we perked for you. I knew you flew out all the way from California. I respect your time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what do you do there, right? So, so, so you've got these uh, students that work for you, mm-hmm. and my understanding is that you work exclusively on asylum cases there, and maybe in your practice, or w- w- what's that like? Um, mm. Exclusively in removal defense. Removal defense, So okay. for the people who are newly arrived, it's mostly asylum, but or at least they came with the intention of seeking asylum, but if they're eligible for a different type of humanitarian benefit that, say less traumatic for them than recounting everything that happened to them that was horrific, uh, that is less work for us Mm -hmm. since we're doing this for free and less complicated cases means we can take on more clients. You know, sometimes they're not all asylum cases. We also do detained work to the extent that anyone is detained in New England Uh, And those are mostly people with longer term ties to the community. So a little bit of um, cancellation of removal, very uh, appropriate to the case we're talking about today. And the yes, the history of the Supreme Court fighting with uh, ICE about what is actually required in the way of paperwork. (laughs) Yeah, 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 I bet. And so, yeah, I I remember... um, I mean, we met for the first time, I think, or became aware of each other when I was working on the uh, detention center project in Charleston, South Carolina. Mm-hmm. Isn't that right? So, and, 2018 with Ortega yeah. and... Uh, Tenas Burola. Yeah. Right. So. Um, <laughs> oh, you're looking at the people. I'm like, you know, when the Nicaraguan government decided to shoot students in the head. <laughs> That's funny. I was like, I'm just going to go with it. There was a guy, Ortega, with us. Yes. Yes, that was me. (laughs) No, I was referring to the Sandinistas. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I was like, of course. Yes. Yes, Ortega. Yes. He loved fiery Cheetos. It was the South. I don't know why. Okay. Uh, But yeah, and and that was a project. And um, there was... um, we're doing that massive collaborative representation, which mm-hmm. was pioneered by Law Lab, Stephen Manning, um, Ian. Who has stayed at my house. No way. Yeah, when he came to do the training that um, Charlotte Center hosted, we had, to put, we had to find places to put people up. Oh, well, that must be the first time we met then. Maybe. It was a Charlotte Center training. Did you know I was the only person at that Charlotte Center to take two asylum cases? Do you know why? <laughs> because I you're... didn't know any better. <laughs> <laughs> That's exact, and it took, and I took those cases. They were both uh, gang violence cases. Oh, so nice and easy in yeah, Charlotte. Nice and easy in Charlotte. <laughs> one was from Honduras. One was from Guatemala. Uh, Keith, this is where you might ask. Both what were is with gang couch. Violence? Yeah, I actually am familiar with it, but yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You are. I am with gang violence in Honduras. Are you familiar with asylum? Based on gang violence. Yeah, people come out. Yeah. Okay, awesome. I'm just, he was like, you thought I was a regular guy? No, no, no. I've been reading. I've been reading this. I don't, I don't live in a cave. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I had Pet Nato. Oh, so much better. <laughs> and um, I got Shingles. I was staying at Tennis Barola's house before the first master. And I call my wife at 11 o'clock at night. I'm like, can you tell me what this is on my face? And she goes, oh, my God. That's Shingles. She's a physician. She goes, you need to go to urgent care. So I go to urgent care, and it started here, goes here. I show up, so, I guess, eight hours later. I had an 8.15 in Pat Nato's uh, courtroom. For those that don't know, Pat Nato. Isn't Shingles contagious? Uh, uh, I don't. No, they told me it wasn't. Okay, yeah. chicken pox is chicken pox is not okay. same virus. Okay, I'm not a doctor, okay. but he said it was it was fun. <laughs> and uh, so I show up, pet not his courtroom. He was he was like the three headed. To be clear, I am fine with you infecting pet Nato with a painful disease. That's not my objection. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Who was it? Um, Alex, who he runs the law office right next to the immigration court. He told me to wear a pink tie, Pat Nato. So, <laughs> so that's what I did. I wore a pink tie. And so I come to his courtroom. It's 8.15. Shingles has progressed all the way down my face. I'm sweating. I'm running a temperature of 101.5. And I totally botch my first master's ever. With the first client, like I botch it. I don't know what I'm doing. Like I'd sat in and watched, but we get through it. We schedule it. We get the sound claim in. He goes, he, and Matt Pananano, he goes, he goes, well, I hope that was instructive for the whole court. And I go, I go, I go, Judge Pananano, just you wait. Cause I'll tell you what, I'm also the next case up. Or I said something like that, but it was, it was quick. I'm like, I'm like, no, I said, if you thought that was great, that's what I said. <laughs> if you thought that was great, just wait till you see who's next up. And he looks at the sheet, sees I'm the next lawyer, and he starts laughing. <laughs> then the court starts laughing, and then I do the next thing. Okay. Um, anyway, it was a terrible court, but that's how I think we met. And those cases took me four years. I took them through BIA appeal, and then Law Lab took them back to take them to the federal because we lost them in BIA. So that's how we had. So we've we've known each other of or we've touched kind of through through our service for about six years, mm-hmm. and um, we you emailed me randomly um, probably around February or March of this year and said let's get lunch, mm-hmm. and then about fifteen emails and three months later we made it happen. <laughs> uh, that was my, that was on me, and this came about and. I asked you, do you want to do a podcast? And you said, only if we can discuss Campos Chavez. <laughs> only if we can discuss Campos Chavez. <laughs> that was the quote. And so I said, okay, I would have said yes to whatever. You can you can, you can say whatever. Like, I yes. could have picked a much more interesting okay. topic. <laughs> um, so why did you want to discuss Campos Chavez? I mean, for one thing, I think it had just come out the day before you emailed me. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> so it was top of mind. But I think it's a really useful and really maddening example of the way courts, but this court especially, will play around with these esoteric higher level discussions about citations and what the rule means and completely miss the point of Mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a little bit about what the rule is? Sure. The rule is at the basic level, if you are going to request permission to deport somebody from this country, there are forms that are used for that purpose. And the person you're trying to deport has a right to know that this is happening and has to be given the opportunity to participate. Mm, mm, mm. And... Then there's like a very technical component that mm-hmm. was central to Campos Chavos where we had um, these two. So U.S. Code 1229, Section A, Subsections 1 and 2. And these two sections, so 1229, Subsection or Section A and Section uh, A1 and Section A2, had to do with the notice to appear and the notice of change in time or place of proceedings. 
do you want to give an introduction of just what? Sure. Yeah. So since the 90s, the government, by the government, I mean ICE and specifically um, both the officers mostly at the border, but, you know, out there in the world who are serving these documents on people, but also the attorneys in the office who are doing the follow-up paperwork have taken advantage of rules that give them the flexibility to do as much of the proper procedure as is practicable, as I think the word. And there have been lower level cases about what's appropriate, how much is really necessary. And then in 2018, um, the Supreme Court takes a case and basically this guy had been given the documents that say, hey, the government's going to kick you out of the country. And then nothing happened. And the original documents said, we're going to figure out later when and where you have court. You'll, you'll be hearing from us. And then nothing. And then nothing. And then nothing. And by the time they go to tell him when he has court, he doesn't live there anymore. And so he doesn't get his notice. And he finds out years later that he was ordered removed. And so he goes and he reopens his case. And at that point, he's been in the U.S. long enough that he says, I am entitled to ask to stay here because of how my getting deported would affect my U.S. citizen family members. And the government says, oh, no, no, no. You have to be here 10 years before we give you that piece of paper. We gave you that piece of paper 13, however many years ago. You hadn't been here 10 years then. And so that was what the fight was about. He's like, but your piece of paper wasn't adequate it didn't have everything it was supposed to have. And so it shouldn't bar me. You didn't do everything properly. So you don't get to stop the clock on me being eligible for this thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court says, yeah, that that is right. Your document was deficient. This is a very technical eligibility rule. Government, you wrote it. When you get to write the rules, you have to follow them. You got to make them be whatever that you want, but whatever you make up, you got to do. And so that was the first, I think, of people starting to try to capitalize on the fact that the government wasn't following the rules and it wasn't following the rules to people's detriment. And that case was decided eight to one, I believe. What was the name of that case? That was Pereira v. Sessions right, of in course. 2018. So this is Pereira v. Sessions, uh, eight to one, and Sotomayor writes... The majority opinion? Yep, it's everybody but Alito. Yeah. Who? <laughs> so, okay, so, and that is, until this decision on June 14, 2024, Pereira is used extensively, right, mm -hmm. by attorneys to try and protect the rights of their mm -hmm. clients. And I remember, yeah, sorry, you go on. And, and in a lot of ways, but one of the ways it's important is for other people who had this exact thing happen that Mr. Pereira had, which was that the government attorneys sat on getting that next notice out for so long that when it finally went out, it went to an outdated address. And to me, this is the crux of all of this fighting about what should the government actually be required to do? And it's so frustrating that the Supreme Court ignores it in this newest decision when it's so clear in the original decision that this is an issue. The way normal courts work, or at least every normal court I've ever appeared in, I'm not barred in all 50 states, I'm not barred in Puerto Rico, I haven't done every area of law that there is. But generally, when you go to serve the opposing party and let them know that you're dragging them into court, there's already a case open in the court. There is a court that agrees, yes, there is a case here. Both of you can file things to it. The person 
can go to court and respond right away if they want. The way immigration court works for reasons that make no sense to me is ICE, if they want to deport you, they hand you the paperwork saying we would like to deport you before they tell the court. And then they get around to telling the court that they want to deport you whenever they feel like it or whenever they remember. But until they do that, you have no way of letting the court know, hey, they got my address wrong. I don't live there. Or, hey, I did live there, but I have moved. If you're going to send me notices, if you're going to change the time of my hearing, this is where you have to send it now. And Maureen, I want to, so this is really key. When a court makes a decision and a regular person hears about it, it can sound very sensical because they assume that the underlying system on which this court case is going to be applied (laughs) works as sensical, as rational, as fair. Mm -hmm. And one of the differences between being a professional and a layperson is that you understand that that's not true. Right. Right. In law. Um, and, And especially in a system that is been administered without the help of Congress for at least 23 years since the last time we had immigration legislation in 2001. So I want to be clear here, this point that people can't change addresses. Exactly. There's, there is a part of code 1229 that says Congress must, or the uh, DHS basically must have a central repository, right? That holds on to addresses. Mm-hmm. Can yeah. I ask a practical question? Yeah, sure. Wouldn't somebody do a change of address with the Postal Service and that even if the court sent it to the wrong address? I'm not saying the Postal Service is by any means. I mean, it just seems that that would solve it. Well, that assumes that an immigrant who may have arrived last week understands that that's something the Postal Service does. Fair point. Or that the Postal Service would even recognize them maybe with out some sort of form of legal ID. But that's that's an interesting point. But that's nowhere here. And I'm also not yeah. certain that I know there are certain types of mail that the Postal Service will not forward. I'm not certain they'll forward work permits, court notice. Forward. Yeah. Oh. Certain government mail won't get forwarded. And I'm not claiming this is one of them. I'm just saying I don't know. But I I think that the unfamiliarity with our system. Um, given who this is affecting, um, is a pretty big issue, regardless of whether or not the Postal Service would do that. So then clearly, there is no way to change your address with the courts unless you have an open case. Exactly. And a notice to appear, which you're going to be talking a lot about today, an NTA notice to appear, does not open the case. It doesn't when it's given to you, only when it's given to the court. And there is no mandatory minimum amount of time between the first happening and the second. So if ICE serves me uh, with a notice to appear that doesn't have the date or time, it's because they haven't served it on the court, or if they've served it on the court, the court hasn't set up a new case, Mm -hmm. right? Well... Or, Or is that wrong? I mean, I suppose in theory, they could have served it on the court... And the court just hasn't generated the document yet. And in in that case, you could still go to court and say, here's my new address, and they would take it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there's no guarantee that that's happened exactly. Okay. And so there's, because there's no guarantee, we can say unequivocally, there are cases where you will get an NTA and you have nowhere to turn if you need to change your address, if you need to update the court, because the court doesn't know you exist yet. Exactly. I have had clients who will check and will say, okay, I've checked with the court. You don't have anything. And the best advice I can tell them is send it in anyway. It will be rejected. You need to hold on to that rejection letter like it is a spare kidney for your child, a winning lottery ticket, whatever, because someday they're going to file that and you're not going to know and you're going to miss court. (laughs) And this is hopefully going to be when you finally realize that that happened, what makes the difference between the judge reopening your case or not? Mm. 
I remember um, there was a case, a 601A case. That was a long case. It was a case that made it all the way up to federal court. But a work permit had been filed for this person while they were in detention and had been wrongly rejected by USCIS. And he got the rejection. And for years, they couldn't open up this case. We eventually, I won, I won the case in the Fourth Circuit, came back down because Gigi Gardner changed the law on 601As in, uh, in the Fourth Circuit. Go Gigi Gardner, awesome lawyer out of Raleigh. And uh, in 2023, I was able to get his work permit based on that rejection. Oh, wow. And he was still in detention? No, he's not. He was out of detention, okay. but he was not otherwise eligible after administrative closing on the 601A to get mm-hmm. a work permit. But we were able to show that because he had been improperly rejected like 10 years ago for this work permit, he would have in, he should have in fact had it. So it was a nunc pro tunc grant. They gave it to us in 14 days. Wow. At USCIS. But that was the same sort of thing. Where it's just mm-hmm. hold on, like file it and then hold on to, okay. All right. I broke your chain of thought, but <laughs> I broke your chain of thought. You're rolling. So keep yes. rolling. So in 2018, the Supreme Court says, no, no, you really have to put dates and times on these things. People need to know from the beginning, where are they going to have court? When do they have to show up? And ICE responds, and I I think this is relevant because these later decisions, including the one um, that happened this year, assumes good faith actors trying their best. And that's not what we have here, because I don't know if you remember what uh, ICE decided to do in 2018. They just started putting any random date and time on there. Didn't correspond to a real court date. You know, things like December 25th at two in the morning. Mm. And that one was not that bad, because at least that one, you could look at a person and be like, that is not a real court date. The court is not going to be open on Christmas. It's definitely not (laughs) going to be open (laughs) at two in the morning. Was that like a real one you got? Probably. Probably. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, but definitely it was, it was insane. Got, I definitely got ones that I looked at and said, no, that's that's not real. <laughs> I got a 6 a.m. one once. <laughs> <laughs> that's right on the cusp where I'm like, is that a really psychotic judge trying to deal with his backlog? It wasn't. <laughs> right. Um, but then there'd also be totally normal nine o'clock on a Wednesday that just weren't real. And it was in the news. Remember, courts were getting slammed with, you know, 600 extra people, I think, in Miami that didn't really have court dates. And then the people that the judge was actually expecting to see couldn't get through security because the line was around the block. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. But, you know, technically meets all the requirements. <laughs> And so then they could reschedule and say, hey, we, we put everything right. in there and um, mm-hmm. they could keep going. Right. It, it looks like. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then there's another decision. This all goes back up to the Supreme Court because ICE is either complying in a way that's completely disrespectful and counterproductive to the idea of actually giving people notice. Or they're just ignoring. They're doing both. They, they go back to not putting dates and times on pretty quickly. And Nish Chavez, oh boy, Justice Gorsuch, is a big fan of his own wit um, and a big fan of telling the government that we don't care that you like paperwork. You don't like paperwork. Nobody likes paperwork. It's your paperwork. And I will admit, I got a big kick out of that. <laughs> Reading that decision. But it's also kind of the start of let's play around with the rule as a theoretical concept and not let's examine these rules to see if they meet the standards for a functional and baseline fair legal system. Mm, this is Niv Chavez. Yes. Okay. Which assuming Kavanaugh is discussing the procedural history correctly in his dissent, um, the Gorsuch doesn't touch it at all. It looks like it was somebody who went through his entire case, lost, and then was attempting to reopen based on 
um, Pereira and the fact that there had been a deficient NTA. And Kavanaugh's point was, okay, this is rule following just for the sake of rule following. This is more than we need to give people. I don't know because the majority doesn't really grapple with it. There's definitely a world in which certain failures of proper paperwork don't require everything to be thrown out and redone. And I could live with that as long as the rule was let's make sure that people have actual notice, people have a fair chance to participate. And if you meet that burden, but you screw up something, we'll work to fix it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this goes to something you were mentioning earlier before we started taping, where you said, you know, there's there's a certain amount of grace mm -hmm. that can be tolerated for both the government as long as <laughs> that grace is reciprocal. Exactly. Right. And so looking at Pereira, the grace that we're talking about there, even though it aligns with the rule, it's because the rule was basically saying, hey, this sort of grace is important. Mm -hmm. The grace to know when you have a hearing and to actually have a hearing is the, is, 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 uh, the bottom of, is the floor of what we consider fair. Right. Right. Whereas in NIV, right? Kavanaugh saying, well, he got a, they got a full hearing. They got to go through the system. Mm -hmm. Maybe they didn't get the grace of that initial notice, but it seems like they did get the grace of multiple levels of, right? right? And maybe in that case, you can say, okay, may, maybe it, there is some sort of justice and in, in, in not regrant granting a whole new trial. Mm -hmm. Now, I... I'm fine with the decision in Nish, in Niv Chavez, and I think that Gorsuch's ire, although he isn't, I could almost wish he would go further with this because I think, to the extent that there's an argument for no, do it right, do it right, do it right, it's that they are the government with the resources of the government, with the ability to create the rules, and they've been playing silly games, and so. I do think that if you want to get to the point where you have a system that is fair, you have to insist that the government be accountable when they're engaging in practices that deny fairness and deny access. I agree with that. I love that point. So I, I used to hate um, I used to hate the fact uh, this was like 2018. We we're working mm -hmm. on those massive collaborative projects. Um, the whole point of doing these projects where you could represent a lot of people at once by kind of breaking up the a case into small pieces, giving it, farming it out to lots of lawyers and non-lawyers alike, was that there was a recognition that Stephen Manning really elucidated clearly for everybody that we were out matched mm -hmm. by the government's resources. We were outmatched by their technological resources. We were outmatched by their ever-increasing budget ever mm -hmm. since everything went under the DHS umbrella. You could look at the ICE budget basically doubling mm -hmm. over like a three or four year period. And we were, and we outmatched, were outmatched by, the, by our comparative burdens. By our comparative burdens. That's right. Hmm. And so your point is that if we also give the government the benefit of not having to do their own paperwork, that in itself creates a complete inequality that's impossible to overcome. Mm -hmm. Can I sneak in here and yeah. ask a question? Rewind just a little bit. A couple of times, a couple of times you've mentioned Justice Gorsuch being cranky about this. <laughs> exactly. What did he say that, uh, that, that makes him so cranky? Okay. Let's see. Um... And just for those listening, Maureen has a, about a 600 page document in front of her. She's a professor. <laughs> <laughs> she is a professor. Hi. Okay, let me let me find a good one. Is he known for his snark? I am not one of those people that follows the court so closely as to know how to answer that. Okay. <laughs> but he was in the um He was snarky in this. <laughs> and he was in the descent of 
um, campus, which which is interesting. Yeah, no, he, he means it. He wants yeah. these rules to be followed, which I appreciate. Ultimately, the government is forced to abandon any pretense of interpreting the statute's terms and retreat to policy arguments and pleas for deference. The government admits that producing compliant notices has proved taxing over time. (laughs) (laughs) No, my tone is doing a lot of the work there, but not everything. What happens, Maureen, between um, Niv, Chavez, and Campos? Uh, Change in some of the people on the court. I will point out that Niz Chavez is not eight to one. And I I suspect that if I were to do a deep dive, um, it's partly the procedural history, that it wasn't somebody who didn't even know about courts and didn't get notice and all of that. Um, Niz Chavez is six to three. Six to three, yeah. Mm-hmm. And at that point, we don't yet have Justice Barrett Correct. Because Breyer is still on the court mm-hmm. because he wouldn't retire until 2022. Do we have, so we have Gorsuch, he's, Kavanaugh is there. Kavanaugh, Roberts, and Alito are dissenting. So Kavanaugh and Roberts are the two that peeled off. Okay, okay so this is actually interesting. Maybe we can save it later so we don't break the train of thought. But the question of what has changed might just be the politics of the court went in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. I think it's partly that, and I I think it's probably something to do with with procedural, the immigrant removal proceedings went through because Kavanaugh and Roberts both switch side. It's not just personnel changes. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this. Actually, Uh, you're right. It's not any personnel changes because you're right. Byrett's not on the court yet. Right. Okay. As a legal aid attorney, right? You don't you don't deal with the fat cats of Wall Street. <laughs> I don't know that many immigration attorneys deal with the fat cats of Wall Street regardless, but I certainly do not. Yeah, this is this is not a situation where uh where Wolf Smith's character in uh what's the, what's that movie where he plays the dad that's like homeless on the streets? Oh, the pursuit of happiness. This is not pursuit of happiness with like an immigration twist where it's an immigrant that is comes from the streets of New York to to be a big wig at a bank. You're dealing with uh, with pro se litigants. You're dealing with people who can't afford attorneys. You're dealing with people who have very little, not just English literacy, but even literacy in their own languages. No digital literacy. Often, people have a really hard time, right, representing yeah. themselves. And people who are going to be left to represent themselves if my agency or one of the very few like it uh, does not have room for them. How does this impact them? And by this, I mean Ms. Chavez, Campos, Chavez, this requirement or this new freedom or new deference maybe given to the U.S. government to not have to have compliant notices to appear. Um, I mean, sadly, not very much because, as you know, the Board of Immigration Appeals, which is the first level um, appellate judicial body, not an appe- not an independent body, part of the Department of Justice. Employees. Couch of... sits on it. Couch sits on it. <sighs> yes, yes, he does. The greatest judge for the wrong side. His ninety eight percent lifetime rejection rate of asylum claims. True story. He was very nice to my mother when I met him out and about in Charlotte once. So I will I will just leave it at that. He was nice to your mother. I was very tempted to tell the people getting our food at Sabor exactly who he was to see what they would do to his food, but uh, I refrained. (laughs) Hitler kissed babies. (laughs) I was going to pull in Hitler. I was just just saying. If Benedict Cumberbatch only knew who he had really uh, portrayed (laughs) in that biopic. That's it. That's it. That's it. (laughs) We all contain multitudes. Um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. It's like we're not um, in the Fourth Circuit. or the immigration So, yeah. as you know, the Board of Immigration Appeals has been working since the day Pereira was decided to really limit its scope to just whether or not people 
maintain eligibility for that one particular type of humanitarian application to stay and not broaden its scope um, past that. They've been infuriatingly successful. And now with the Supreme Court's decision on the issue that I think is the most important in terms of what does it mean to have a charging document that is deficient, that doesn't give people all of the information that they really need to participate in their case, um, which is what do you do when people miss court and they didn't get paperwork that was procedurally sufficient? Supreme Court has said they just don't care. So it's, it's not going to get any better. Well, that's not good. No, no. It's too silent. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I've grown up. In a, as a from a baby lawyer, baby immigration lawyer, to now, in a world where only the court and the executive have made changes to immigration laws, there has never, in my career, been a congressional action impacting the rights of immigrants, to my knowledge. If we're talking about mine, do we count letting 245i lapse? That would be action through inaction, yeah. I guess, right? Sure. It, but well, it's an no, inaction. I was, I, was, I was practicing when um, the 2008 uh, Trafficking Act was, was passed. Okay. So, so that made some changes. So that made some tra- And what was Adam? Adam Walsh was way before that, right? Oh, Adam, God, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, so nothing in my career... Actually, even if I'd become a lawyer straight out of law school, I guess I would have caught 2008. No, I wouldn't have been in, um, in law school. Therefore, it feels there's a finality that feels unearned when the Supreme Court says we don't care. Mm-hmm. Because the only remedy remaining is either somebody pens a letter like Andrew Jackson saying the court has made its decision, now let it enforce it. Which, to be clear, what the court is saying here is we're not going to make the executive do its job properly. The president certainly could. It wouldn't even be a Jacksonian issue. Biden could absolutely say, I am going to make DHS actually file charging documents with the court on the same day they are served on a respondent. Yeah, you're right. What does it say about my bias <laughs> or lack of civic knowledge? Yeah, you're right. I mean, we saw it, right? We saw it to our dismay and to the shock of everybody when uh, Jeff Sessions comes in and starts putting out all these executive <laughs> orders saying, hey, we're not going to recognize DV-based asylum claims. Mm-hmm. We're not going to recognize, what else was it? There was a gang. gang. This is in a case that was about DV asylum, wasn't even about gangs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the attorney general just has that power, so it shall be done. So it shall be decreed, right? So, so I guess, I guess we could. So, one question is why, why doesn't it, or why didn't it? Um, I, th- I think people, people do not realize unless you are working in this court system, you don't realize how dysfunctional it is because this would never fly in a real court. The idea that I'm going to serve, first of all, the idea that, well, if it's inconvenient, you don't have to do personal service and you just get to declare that it's inconvenient and that's fine. There's no standard. There's no requirement that you go to a judge and show that you went through your due diligence and actually tried to affect service. There's just do it if you feel like it. It would be nice. But then the idea that I can serve you with paperwork and then not actually start the case for five, six, seven, whatever years, but you remain on notice, you remain obligated 
to update me or the court that doesn't, that won't take your updates about what your address is. And if you do not do that, it's your fault that you don't get notification about court a decade later when I get around to filing paperwork and my notice to you hasn't somehow expired is absurd. Can I ask you something? Like when, when I think about um, all the absurdities in the system and things that slow things down, I mean, our backlog is close to 2 million cases now of the court. What was the track? Oh, gosh, data? I have no idea. I'd have to look. <laughs> if you told me it was twice that, I would have believed you. I remember when I started practice, um, this is before sessions came in, the backlog was thought to be hard to overcome. Mm-hmm. And it was at like, I want to say three to 500,000, somewhere in that range. And then Sessions says, all administratively closed cases are back on the docket. <laughs> Yay. And, and, and uh, these are like cases in, in, in the liminal space between life and death, <laughs> where, where they're like closed and they're kind of have a soft to pretty hard, mm-hmm. to pretty permanent promise to reopen, to not be reopened, except Sessions is like, no, we're going to reopen all of them. So our backlog jumps to like 800,000. Mm-hmm. And by the end of the Trump administration, we're sitting at 1.2 million. COVID comes, we get to 1.5, we start creeping up and up and up. We, we might be above 2 million. I, I'm not sure. The point is that we would have to hire uh, several hundred more judges who would themselves have to work 700 to 1,000 cases a year, close, mm-hmm. to reduce that backlog to something that could be closed out every year by like 2032. <laughs> Okay, so I'm sure I got many or all those numbers wrong, but the gist is correct. As my mm-hmm. father, so my father, uh, who speaks with an accent, he would hate it when, uh, as a young kid, as, as you should, when I'd correct him. And he would say, you know, you understood what I said. <laughs> He's like, you are laughing, but you understand. He goes, how do you think language works? How do you think language works? Why do you think accents exist? He goes, you understood what I said. So, okay, you guys understood what I said. And um, I have a, a where I, I don't know if I struggle, but what I think about as a, an immigration lawyer in the system is how do you catch up? Because to have a system that functions, we need to not only be able to process people who are seeking asylum, not only should we be able to process benefits in a timely way, we also have to clear the backlogs. Mm-hmm. And neither the executive, as far as I can see, nor the courts, nor the legal bar has the ability to do that. So what are we in? We're upset that this has happened. And it seems like another wrench, another terribly distorted wrinkle in the, on the face of immigration. Uh, so it looks like nothing else in our system. What's the impact of this really, though? On a system so broken? I mean, like I said, I I don't think this breaks it further. I think this just gives them permission to keep not fixing it. Does it make you, does Project 2025 ring any alarm bells in your head? <laughs> for, those, for those listening, she, her eyes went down. <laughs> She's thinking about being a professor again. I feel like every time I get interviewed about immigration law, there's always that question to which I can only respond with maniacal laughter. (laughs) I don't even have the bandwidth for Project 2025. I... The thought of just going back to Project 2017... Hilarious. ...would be bad (laughs) enough. I, I can't even start thinking about what new permission he will take from getting actually reelected. Are you still thinking of not staying in immigration law? I'm still thinking of not staying in this country. I would say nothing is off the table. What are you currently working on? Um, I mean... The usual mix of, I've got a couple of Central American gang cases, 
couple of decent ones where it's it's very clearly family targeting. I've got some sexual orientation cases in the mix, race-based, indigenous, got a bunch of different things going on, applications for residency for the few asylum cases that that got approved. Yeah. Those are happy ones. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Oh, I'll I'll tell you about procedurally about a case that that shows you just how messed up this address issue is. Because in addition to not having to start the case right away, we touched on this a little bit, but the standard for ICE to make sure that they're turning over a good address to court and the standard for the court to do any sort of checking when checking can be done is ridiculous. So I took on a case a couple of years ago, one of the cases I mentioned, and it was, you know, she was in immigration court. We were raising asylum as a defense to getting deported. And she didn't have her notice to appear anymore. Uh, it had been in her car. Her car had gotten stolen. She just didn't have it. I wasn't able to get to the court to review the physical file before we had to have our hearing and we had to say whether or not we had gotten served, et cetera. And this was past COVID. You know, everything was on video. So it wasn't like I was physically in the court the way you used to be when I used to say, you know, if, if your honor, if I could just approach the bench and read your honor's copy and then have a brief discussion with my client. That wasn't going to be possible. And so we had to say, look, we're going to have to hold the government to their burden. They have the burden of showing proper service. She doesn't have the document anymore. I'm not in a position to review it. We're going to ask that the government prove that they served her. And that was it. I was pretty sure that the paperwork wasn't appropriate because the paperwork is never done correctly, but I couldn't just say it hadn't been. Mm. And so that was my answer for for all of it, you know, where the allegations against her, I'm going to have to hold the government to its burden. I don't know. And so the judge says, okay, well, government wasn't expecting to do this, so they have until however many days. And they just didn't. And I hadn't made a motion to terminate if they hadn't or anything like that. Um, And this was after Fernandez, which was a a case from the Board of Immigration Appeals that said, no, no, if the charging document, if the notice to appear isn't adequate, the judge is permitted to throw the case out, but he's not required to. He can allow the government to fix and reserve with proper paperwork. And they definitely could have done that. I mean, at this point, there's a case, you know, there's a case in court. There's a next hearing date. It would have been incredibly easy for them to just do that. I didn't really care. We had a very solid case. She was going to get her work authorization. She really wanted it to go quickly. And I was, we had a good judge. I would have been fine with keeping it in court. And they just didn't do anything. And after about six months, the judge just lost patience and said, I am terminating because the government hasn't proved that they served her properly. Mm. And so I said, okay. Um, I told my client, we're going to have to file your asylum again with USCIS, basically the Department of Immigration. It's where you go to file asylum if the government is not trying to kick you out of the country at the moment. And... We had to update some things because she had moved and she had a couple of children who were not in court with her who could be added on to the case now that she wasn't in court um, because the court doesn't have jurisdiction over the rest of your family that's not in court. So we had to do a little bit of paperwork. It took about six weeks to get it refiled. And they took it and she got her work card and kids got their work cards. Everything was fine. And we're just sitting there two years on wondering when she's going to get her interview. And I get a notice that the whole thing's been denied because she's in removal proceedings. And of course, I think, oh, this this is going back to she was in removal proceedings. Like, I filed the whole thing with a copy of the judge's termination order. This is weird. And so I contact 
the ombudsman, basically the quality control desk for, for immigration. I'm like, hey, this happened. It probably shouldn't have. I don't hear from them. I go to follow up and I'm like, you know what, just to make sure, let me check they haven't refiled this notice to appear. They had done it five days later. Immigration was just two years slow to figure it out. They never should have taken it. They never should have given her a work card. I am two years late filing her asylum application in front of the judge. But the reason nobody knew about it was when they refiled it, they used her old original address back from when they filed it the first time, improperly, by the way. I have now seen a copy because in the interim, they've scanned everything and uploaded everything. And it was, you know, as sloppy as I thought it was going to be. They did not use the address that I put down for her when I made my entrance as her attorney, nor the address that I used for her when I filed for her asylum, which was where she was living when they remailed it. And the judge, when the court decided to remail things, they didn't look at, oh, wait, we had a file that was open just a week ago. Let me go look in there and see what the paperwork there says about address. They just took that same old notice and sent it to that same old out-of-date address. And it is only by luck or divine intervention that they scheduled her court date so far out that USCIS that took two years to notice that this had happened, noticed it eight weeks before her court date. Oh, and the reason why they didn't serve me? Well, now that it's terminated, I'm not the attorney of record on this brand new court case. So of course they're not going to serve me. So does she have to go back to court? Yeah. I mean, I could fight about it, but like I said, she's got a strong case and court's going to be a lot faster. And also at this point, she is now really sick of that nonsense and just wants it to stay in one place so that she can have a decision. Well, <laughs> as Jeremy Clarkson says, and on that terrible disappointment, <laughs> on that note of terrible disappointment, we'll, uh, we'll cut it here. Maureen, how do people reach you? Oh, I work for New Haven Legal Assistance. So if they are looking for an attorney, they actually don't reach me directly because we do not charge for our services. Um, we make our decisions about representation uh, collectively. So they would just either walk in at 205 Orange or Google New Haven Legal Assistance and the website will give them information about how to reach out to seek an attorney. Cool. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>